For your first father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you once again, Father, for us to be in your presence. Thank you for your love, your joy, and your peace. Thank you for these who have come out to study your word this morning as we continue our journey and study through the book of Joshua. Thank you for allowing us to uh, have the power of the Holy Spirit to understand what you have us to understand today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Joshua chapter 4. Let's see if I can put it up on my other. I'll have you guys read it if you have the other scriptures there as well. So we, we've, we're, we're understanding now that Joshua, Joshua was right after the wilderness experience, right? After the 40 years, Joshua picks up right after the 40 years of the wilderness experience. And, uh, and what was the wilderness experience? Why did they have to wander in the wilderness for 40 years? Just uh, Everybody just didn't want to go into the, the uh, land and promise the honey. He told you he didn't want to wander in the wilderness until everybody's gone. So, right now, why didn't they want to go into the promised land? Because they were told there were giants yeah. right. of that nature. And so they were fear. They, yeah. they got scared. They were afraid. They didn't trust God. They didn't. So, they rather believe the 10, instead of it was 12 spies that came back. And then uh, 10 of the spies said, oh, no, it's giants over there. We can't go over there and take that land. Two of them came back because, see, they beat Joshua and Caleb back. <laughs> so they got to the people first. So when two people came back and said, oh, yeah, it's great. It's the land for all the milk and honey. Come on, let's go. They're like, man, y'all crazy. Y'all go about your business. Y'all tell we ain't going over there. So, yeah, they, because of that, Act of uh, fear. My question to you today: Can we walk in fear like that today too? No. That will stop us. No. Can fear stop us? Yeah. Yes, it can. Yeah. It, shouldn't, but. it shouldn't, but fear can't stop. Don't you know, people? The reason we call, we call them phobias. Mm -hmm. and phobia is another Greek term for fear. That's all it is. It just means fear. Fear of something. Oh, I got a arachnophobia. That means you have a fear of spiders. Some people have fear of heights, right? Fear of dogs, fear of this, fear of that. And so if you have a fear of heights, what would that block you from doing? If you have fear of heights? Climbing mountains. Climbing mountains, what else? Steps. Um, that's, that's real severe. If you can't go up the steps, <laughs> you, you really can't. You really can't. Elevator. Yeah. Elevator. You won't ever enjoy an elevator. You won't enjoy escalators. You're right. Some people are not like getting on that thing. You see how steep that thing is? Planes. Yeah, exactly. You won't get on a plane. So fear stops. The uh, Bible says fear brings torment. That's what it does. It brings torment. If you're afraid, you are tormented. So therefore, it will stop you from doing some things. Uh, chapter 1. So God opens up Joshua. Chapter 1 showing you about faith. We saw the faith of Joshua becoming that leader. Chapter 1. Then chapter 2 of Joshua, we saw Rahab's faith. Remember? The spies came back. Chapter 3, which we studied last week and a couple of weeks before. Chapter 3 was, we now need to see some faith out of the people. We saw the faith in Joshua chapter 1. We saw the faith in Rahab chapter 2. Now we need to see some faith in the people. We see the faith in the people and starting in chapter 3 that they had to cross what? The Jordan River. This is a continuation. So chapter 4 is a continuation of chapter 3. So let's uh, look at chapter 4 and just a synopsis of the first 24 verses. We either go, even though we're going to go through each verse. But I probably won't be able to finish this till next week. Uh, but it says, uh, the chapter presents the dynamic truth that the hope of the future is based on the memories of the past. The hopes of the future is based on the memories of the past, and this hope gives meaning to the present. So if you run into people that say the past don't mean anything, Ah, they got another thing coming. Because if you don't learn about the past, guess what can happen to the, in the future? You can repeat it. It can be repeated. If we don't remember the past, we, we will wind up repeating the past. We can repeat it if you don't learn from it. So we can't say the past is not good. We can't say, I just want to read the New Testament. You can't just say you want to just read the New Testament. Oh, the Old Testament is the 
pass it. We don't live under the law. That's true. We don't. But you still can learn from it. And in order to remember the Old Testament, we've got to remember the Old Testament so we can understand the New Testament and appreciate the New Testament. We can, we can, we can read the Old Testament, even though we don't live under the law, we can read it to find out why God allowed them to go through what they went through in the Old Testament so we can appreciate the New Testament. You know, we, we as African American people have to do a better job, we started talking about this last week, of coming up with ways for us to remember what happened to us as a people. Because we don't talk about it. Yeah. No, we don't talk about it. We used to. We used to talk about it, you know, African American history used to be huge in our schools. Oh, it's just another day now. Yeah, they, people don't want to be. They don't even do any projects anymore. They don't do anything for black, I mean, we have a whole month called Black History Month. Schools don't do anything huge anymore for that. We don't have no parades for Black History Month. We don't take huge amount of kids down to the African American Museum to let them see what happened in their history. We don't do that. So that's going to be to our fault because 20 years from now, well, you can look at it now. Look at the kids now. Because we haven't really talked to them about what? The past. You look at the past uh, Tuesday, uh, yeah, the election. Did nobody vote? Sure did. That's why I said Wayne County. Deal with those. Yeah, Wayne vote. County was Democratic, but then how many of the people in Wayne County voted? That's the point. That's right. They looked at the numbers like, oh, where, where everybody at? Mm -hmm. We, you know, I work in school. I got a lot of 18, 19, 20 year olds. So before the election, you gonna vote? No. You gonna vote? No. I ain't. You know, my vote don't matter. That doesn't, you know, kids. People say that. Okay, all right. Don't matter. Yeah. Okay. So once again, if we don't teach them. Why it's so important for us to vote. Don't you know people died so you can vote? Don't you know it was only 30, maybe 40 years ago we couldn't vote at all? Exactly. Wow. We couldn't even vote. We were sitting on the back of the bus. And people, you and you ask young people, but to me, I don't blame my 18 and 19 year old because we haven't done a good, good job of what? Training them up to understand how important it is to vote. We did that teachers and stuff like that. So we can't do that. So this chapter is about remembering the past. We're in chapter 4 of the book of Joshua. This chapter is about remembering the past to, to as he says, the dynamic truth that the hope of the future is based on the memories of the past. And this hope gives meaning to the present. Uh, verse 1 through 8, 12 stones picked up from the riverbed became a memorial to God's Faithfulness. When we're going to talk about that, we're going to look at each verse. That's the verse, the first eight verses. They were set up in Gilgal, which was about one and a half miles from Jericho, which was Israel's first campsite in the invaded land. You're going to find that in verse 19 through 20. And then placing the 12 stones in the riverbed itself commemorated the place which God dried up. You know, they had two sets of stones. They had a set of stones in the riverbed of the Jordan, and then they had a set of 12 stones um, in Gilgal, which is right outside of Jericho, because that's what God told them to do. So look at verse 1. And I'll be reading from the uh, uh, King James Version. This is the King James Version, Joshua chapter 4, verse 1. And it came to pass, when all the people were clean and passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, and it says that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying as follows. So what is he saying here? We can see by the beginning of this chapter that it supposed to relate to the last chapter. So now it is clear that God is what? Speaking to Joshua. Because the people were able to cross the Jordan. And they crossed the Jordan through a miracle. God had to, just like he parted the Red Sea, he had to part the Jordan the exact same way. There was water on both sides. They had to walk through the Jordan River. The people had to see it, and when they saw it, they believed it. It was a miracle, and they started having faith that God called Joshua as a leader, right? So now Joshua will receive. In this chapter, he's now going to receive further instructions. So I got the people across. We made it across. God, what do you want us to do now? What do you want us to do? We made it across the Jordan. What do you want us to do now? Look at verse 2. Take you 12 men 
out of the people, out of every tribe, a man. So Joshua, before this, ordered 12 men to take uh, to be taken among them, which seems to have been done before. But he says, God says in verse 2, out of every tribe, I want you to take one man. Right? Now, this person that he takes out of every tribe is going to represent who? That entire tribe. He said, I want you to take one man out of every tribe, and I want you to do something. Look at verse 3. And God says, and command ye them, saying, take you hence out of the midst of the Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and you shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where you shall lodge this night. So what is he asking him to do? I want you to take these twelve men, one out of each tribe. I want you to go back to take tell them to go back to the River Jordan, grab a large stone. Every last one of them. And I want, I want each one of them to carry the stone, take it to the camp that they're going to go to, which is the first camp they built was Gilgal. I want you to make a, uh, he's going to tell us what he wants us to do with it. But they're going to carry it and take it to Gilgal. So once again, it represents each tribe of Israel. Now, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm. So they actually going back into the Jordan to get these stones. Now, a lot of people would like to try to put this passage of scripture in chronological order. You can't do it. Because we're going to read a couple of verses down where he's going to say, take another 12. So some people think that uh, they took the 12 stones before they crossed the river. No. They, take, they are going to take the 12 stones after they cross the river. Now, 12 stones, what does that mean? Each man a stone. And according to the Samaritan Chronicle, every man inscribed his name on the stone. So when we read, because you know, when we get to the book of 1st and 2nd Chronicles, 1st and 2nd Chronicles really reiterates in a shorter, a shorter passage. Those two books reiterate the entire history of Israel from ex from Egypt until they came into the promised land. All the equal lives and the kings and everything. It's going to reiterate everything. We'll get there too. But it says in that book, First Chronicles or Second Chronicles, that not only did they carry the stone, they put their name on the stone. Doesn't the Bible say that uh, when we get to heaven that the twelve apostles there's going to be 12 stones, and each name of the tribe of Israel is going to be on one of those stones. On each stone. It's going to be there again. He's going to do that again. So 12. Uh, he told them 12 to represent the entire nation. So the 12 men uh, that had been chosen, one from each tribe, were each to pick up a stone where the priest stood firm and bring to the west side of the Jordan, which is Gilgal, to be set up. Why? As a what? What did he say? A memorial as a memorial. What is a memorial? To remember. To remember. Uh, I think they just opened up in Washington, D.C., another African American. This is a national African American museum. Yes, it was huge. Uh, President Obama was there, all the speakers, a lot of um, uh, entertainers, of course, celebrities was there. This is supposed to really be like a library. Of, of, of collections of all African Americans that made contributions to the country. So it's right, I think it's near the monument that they built. You know, they built the monument for Martin Luther King as well. So they did, they did that as well. But all of these things, the, the monument, I, I like the library more than the monument of a face because that's not helping us. That library though, where somebody can go in and look up records and watch videos and read the writings of Martin Luther King or see uh, the laws that were passed against for, for slaves and Africans, that's even more effective than anything else to see. So that's great. But these things are a memorial. He says, set these stones up as a memorial. Let's look at verse 4 through 11. And I'm just putting, I'm, I'm going to go through verse by verse, but 4 through 11 is going to tell us this. Some suggest that there's a contradiction found in chapter 3, verse 17, where the Israelites are reported to have already crossed the Jordan. That's not a contradiction. Actually, in verse 4 and 5, which we're about to read now, uh, it simply reports that the 12 men, one from each tribe, were commanded to go back 
where the priest remained standing in the midst of the dry bed of the Jordan. So let's go down to verse 4. And it says this in verse 4. Uh, then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe a man. So it may be that for some other purpose, Joshua 3, 12, but this was the destination of them eventually and by divine direction. Call one out of every tribe. Look at verse 5, Joshua 4, 5. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord, your God, into the midst of the Jordan, and take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. So he says this, take a stone upon your shoulders. So this stone got to be what? Huge. It had to be a big stone because you know they were going to make a monument out of it. They were going to really pile up one stone on the, over the other. That's what they were going to do. So that's what they did in those days. So that is, they were to go back to the Jordan again, which they had passed over, and go into the midst, grab a stone, take it to them, and we're going to take it to Gilgal. Put it on your shoulder. You see, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel who had passed over the Jordan, of which these stones were to be a memorial. Now, the number 12, uh, the number 12 is representative of what? These 12 men represented what? The 12 tribes. So why did Jesus have only 12 disciples? You ever thought about that? There's only 12 disciples, 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, the crossing of the Red Sea was symbolic of what? When they crossed the Red Sea, after coming from Egypt, that was a symbolism of, watch this, water baptism. The wandering in the wilderness was a symbol of our walk as Christians through this life, because we got to go through this life, we're going to get dirty, we're going to get, we got to go through the trials and tribulation of the wilderness here, right? The crossing of the Jordan into the promised land symbolizes Christians entering into heaven. We, we always say that, right? Can't wait till we get to glory land. So the promised land is always a symbolization of heaven. The promised land is not heaven. But it, it always symbolized heaven. So these stones carried into the promised land are, are a memorial to their successful entry. So right? So when they made when they piled up these stones and they made this memorial, they were supposed to look at that memorial and say what? God brought us safely over the Jordan River. What memorials do we have today? as far as Christianity, not African Americans, we can talk about that. But what memorials do we have today as Christians to let us know that we are successful as Christians? What is what memorial has God set up? Resurrection Sunday. Sunday. That's a memorial. Every Sunday we remember what Jesus done for us. What else do we do as a memorial? Uh, communion. communion. That's the number one thing. That is our memorial that we have uh, become successful in Christ. The communion, every time we take it. Now, uh, the scripture says, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So, why is it that we only take it, you, you, we should be like the Catholic Church. They take it every time they go to church. You know that, right? Every week, they call Mass, they take communion every Sunday. Every single Sunday. But we do it once a month. I don't know if it's a a costly thing, I don't know, we don't want to keep that for the cups. Um, <laughs> I don't know. So that comes with juice can add up now. Little cups of juices can add up. Just a box. We bought a box of 200 That was almost $100. I mean, what in the world? They charge a lot of money for that stuff. So, you know, we said, we're going to do this once a month. Yeah, we're going to do this once a month. So we can keep and keep the cost down. But that, he says, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So that is our number one memorial. And, or of course, going to church uh, is another memorial. The scripture says in Hebrews, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. The reason we like to go to church on Sunday, we are not commanded to go to church on Sunday. We can go to church on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, any, any day of the week. We can go to church. But why Sunday? 
Why do we go to church on Sunday instead of Saturday instead of Friday? Why do we like to go to church on Sunday? Like that? It's the first day of the week. It's the first day of the week. We don't have what's, what's important about the first day of the week? What happened on the first day of the week? He rose on the first day of the week. Because you know, before he rose on the first day of the week, the day to go to church was what? Saturday. Saturday. Jews went to church on Saturday like they, uh, the, uh, the Jews today who don't acknowledge Jesus Christ uh, as their Savior still go to church on Saturday till this day. If you don't believe me, just drive over to Oak Park. There's a whole lot of Jewish synagogues over there. You see them and they don't look. They got cars and stuff, but they don't do nothing on Saturday. So they walk to church in the rain, sleet, snow. In the wintertime, they do not drive their cars on Saturday. They, they believe that they cannot operate a motor vehicle on their holy day. So they'll walk to church. And that's why they live closer to their synagogue where they can walk. So they're not driving over there sometimes we're going to Clinton Township to go to the synagogue. No, we ain't going. We better have a synagogue 10 feet away from the house. Because <laughs> they don't believe in that traveling all over here to go to somebody's church to a whole other city and you got a church right down the street. Go to the church in the neighborhood. That's what people used to do. But now people travel all over just to go to one church. But they didn't do that. Jews don't do that. But Sunday is the reason why we come to church because he got up on Sunday. Now, just to remind you, if you run into a conversation with people, we are not commanded to go to church on Sunday. It is not a command. It was just that people wanted to remember the Lord's resurrection every Sunday because he got up on Sunday. So when people say, God, you, you go to church any, any day. Yeah, that's true, you can. If you will find a church that want to go to church every Wednesday or every Thursday, that's fine. Because now people work seven days a week now. They work even on Sundays. Years ago, you nothing was open on Sunday. Everybody went to church. But, you know, America has changed. So now uh, everything is open seven days a week. So now you do have a choice which day you can worship. And if you can get away on Sunday, uh, come on Sunday. I see in a lot of larger churches, uh, they call it now, we talk about churches that have like 10,000 members, they have what they call weekend services. Because they have served like full services like we have on Saturday, on Sunday, they have Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So now you can choose. You go to church on Friday, you can go to church on Saturday, or you can go to church on Sunday. And then they still have their midweek service which is on Wednesday, where you can come to church on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So they they making it, uh, they just make it very reasonable for everybody. And then wait a minute, now even on Sunday, we got a seven o'clock service for you to come to. We got a nine a.m. service for you to come to. I mean, eleven o'clock, and then a three thirty in the afternoon. They have a service. So now, uh, to me, that 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 does make sense because when we were growing up. We went to church every Sunday morning, but we always had afternoon service too. We had two services to go to. Wait a minute, we went to Sunday school, then we went to 11 o'clock service. See, church was all day for us. Then at 3.30, almost every other Sunday, we had somebody else's church or they come into our church. Then at 7 o'clock, we had to go back to communion. Right, because you remember, at communion time, communion was only served at 7 p.m. Every first Sunday. So you had to go to church back at 7 o'clock at night back then. We, we went to church and we baptized. We did all that. So how we got away from that. Now we just made it account, uh, you know, accommodating for everybody. Oh, you can't get up at 11. Well, we got a 7 o'clock service. And yo, you were early. You stayed up in the morning. We got a 3.30 service for you. In Church of God in Christ, every Sunday, they've been doing this since the history of their churches. They got the 11 o'clock service. But every Sunday, they got a 6 o'clock service. Every Sunday, every Friday, they are 100 years old. Every Friday, they got Friday night service, Church of God in Christ. Every, and we ain't, we're not even going to talk about the apostolic churches. They might got church service every day. I mean, they don't, some churches just don't close down their doors at all. Catholic church doors open every day. You can literally go, remember when we went on our vacation, you can literally go to any Catholic church at any time. That door is open. And people, when we walked in, because we wanted to see this beautiful church, is in Chicago. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful. Uh, Catholic cathedral. I mean, it's huge. We had to take pictures of it. That's how beautiful it was. But we went about 12 noon. We were just walking down the street. Walked to the church. People were just sitting there, just quiet. When no service going on, you just go in there and pray. 
Did you have one priest who was there? He didn't say nothing to you. You can sit there for a moment. Then I said, what you doing up in here, dog? No, we didn't. They say, nothing. We sat there, took our little pictures, and we were able to, I think we even walked around and saw some other pictures in the building, and then we walked out. But they open their doors all the time. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's how we present ourselves. But all of this is done as verse uh, uh, one through four has showed us, one through five showed us, it's supposed to be done for what? A memorial. We're doing these things so people can remember who Jesus Christ is. Now watch this. First Peter 2 5 says this about us. Just like they picked those stones up out of the riverbed and it was supposed to be set for memorial, first Peter says this about us. You also are lively stones. We're the stones, right? He says, and are built up, and your lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. You are that lively stone. You are the memorial as far as when the world sees you, we should be reminding them by the way we live, Guess what? That Christ rose. That he rose. That he's alive. That he made changes in people's lives. We are that lively stone. We are the living sacrifice. We are that holy priesthood. We, we, we are what Israel was literally. We are spiritually. Israel had a priesthood. We are the spiritual priesthood. Israel had the, light, the stones. We are the lively stones. Israel had the uh, sacrifices, it, but we are the living sacrifices, holy acceptable to God. So that's what we, we are. So what they received in the promised land was what? They received everything from the promised land by grace. You see how we connect the Old Testament with the New Testament? The Old Testament says they walked into the promised land by grace. That, that wasn't the right. God didn't have to bring all them over here. As a matter of fact, he wiped out a whole generation of them through the wilderness. The only people that made it originally from Egypt was Joshua and Caleb. Not even Moses and his wife made it to the promised land. Only two people that originally were slaves in Egypt made it to the promised land. Joshua and Caleb. All their children who were born in the wilderness, those 40 years, they were the ones that walked into the promised land. Isn't that something? So the promised land is given by grace because everybody didn't have to make it in. And we know everybody did make it in. Guess what we live by? We live by grace. So that means this. If we live by grace, uh, which is God's unmerited favor, everybody's not going to receive God's grace either. And we, no matter how much we preach, no matter how much we teach, everybody is not going to receive. It's given to everybody, but everybody is not going to be willing to accept the grace that God has given them. Uh, so it says, not, that, not only does the Canaan land symbolize heaven, but it also symbolizes the walk of grace as a Christian. So anything, when you read the Old Testament, and the reason we go through Old Testament scriptures and read them, is because it symbolizes our walk as a Christian today. So what they had to go through by faith, and we read their stories, that's why we can pull up a, 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 a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego story. And talk about how they wouldn't bow down. So you can take that and translate it over to the New Testament and say, well, we through faith are not going to bow down just like they didn't bow down. So that's what we should be getting out of the Old Testament. We should not be telling people you got to live by the rules and regulations of the Old Testament because that's not true. Because the rules and the regulations of the Old Testament says you got to kill this animal to be forgiven, you got to eat this, you got to wear that, you got, and we don't live under that kind of law. We're supposed to apply the principles of the Old Testament, the principles of faith from the Old Testament, you apply to the New Testament. But you do not literally read Leviticus, the 11th chapter, and say, this applies to me today. What does Leviticus 11 say? Leviticus 11 is a dietary uh, law, uh, or the dietary laws for the Israelites, what they could eat and what they could not eat. And if people really read the book of Leviticus, they'll read the other chapters that says there were certain cloths, certain material they couldn't even wear. Right? They couldn't wear, I mean, it was, it, it was down to the clothing that it, it was so 
actually meticulous the way God had them live under the law, but we don't, that's not us. We're supposed to pull from the Old Testament the principles, moral principles, and the, uh, the grace principles out of the Old Testament so we can tell those stories over and over again because they do apply to us. Yes, sir. It's sad to say that there, there's a, a famous preacher I hear right now that his people don't need that Old Testament anymore mm. because what God done down, we don't have to worry about what the Old Testament did or what they went through in the past because now he teaches, now that God doesn't resurrect for himself, we can go to him, we ain't got to worry about the past, we ain't got to worry about nothing, we ain't got to worry about the man. I mean, this is what this man preaching. Oh, no, that's not, that's not right. It is. Okay. Yeah, but he don't teach it. He says there's no need for it. Wow. Well, how can he explain where Jesus comes from if there's no need for, for it? Jesus came through the line of Abraham, right? And, uh, who was Abraham if I never knew who he was? But he didn't care less about it. You know, no, he didn't care about none of that. All what God done done for it, that's all he started. That's all. The New Testament done, he do touch on it, but he doesn't go into detail about it. He feels no need for it. What God done done, that's history now. Right. It's a new generation. Right. So, remember, a lot of people don't understand what history means. <laughs> history means this. His story. Not our story. God's story. History means Jesus' story. So we need to always understand everything. When we say history, we talk about history, we talk about his story. And it's easy. we have to go through it. Uh, here's a perfect example. Okay, we're going to celebrate Christmas, right? We're going to celebrate Christmas in December. Okay, if I don't talk about history, then why am I celebrating Christmas? We can't go back to the past. If he says that, we're going to see if he celebrates Christmas. Because if he don't go back to the past, he don't need to talk about the birth of Jesus Christ, do we? And then how Jesus got there, how Mary and Joseph had to go through what they had to go through. They almost got killed and all this kind of stuff. They, he probably won't talk about that. He's just talking about the cross. But see, you can't, you can't just talk about the cross without understanding the history of the cross and where it comes from. That's anything in life. We can't talk about the attitude of African Americans today if we don't go back and try to find out how do we get to where we are today? How did the attitude of African Americans today end up the way it is today? So if you go back 30 years, you can see it. Let's go back 40 years, you can see it. Was it always true? Because if you look at the attitudes of, of African Americans, we have the highest uh, rate of abortion. Was that always true? We have the highest rate of no fathers in the home. Was that always true with African Americans? No. That had a start. That had a beginning. When did it start? When was the beginning? And why is it happening today? That's what history is about. Watch what he says this. He says this. So grace, we are saved by grace, not of ourselves, right? Not only does the kingdom of man symbolize heaven, but it also symbolizes God's grace. Look at verse 6. In Joshua verse 6. We time this okay. We're gonna let this be our last verse, Joshua 4 and 6. That this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Ah, so it says the stones are built and put because it says one day your children are gonna ask. Why do we have these stones? And we, we, what are we supposed to say? We, we're supposed to tell them about the memorial. We're supposed to be telling them about why we have this memorial of stones. So once again, when you talk about memorials, it's always about trying to understand what God has done for us in the past so we won't repeat it, the negative stuff and only keep the positive things that we have learned from the past so we can always stay on track. Because if we don't, we will fall for anything. Any other questions about, as we continue next week, we'll continue with Joshua uh, chapter four next week. But as you can see, we are dealing with uh, the, memor the commemoration and memorizing and actually trying to remember what God has done for us so we can become better Christians. Any other questions or comments? I just, I just got a quick question. I keep listening to these preachers because I'll be sitting in church. I'm <laughs> right. you know, God, just listen to them. But now, I'm just curious. Now these, these preachers are, are calling themselves prophets now. Yes. And they're preachers saying God can build them new prophets, uh, uh, new work, new stuff to them. Right. I mean, I mean how can that, that be? Right. It's not true. Because, you know, somebody's making a joke. I saw a joke on Facebook. Uh, some people 
they call themselves prophets, you know, famous people too. So with some prophets, I'm gonna laugh when I tell you this, say that Donald Trump was gonna be president. The Lord said, oh, you ain't gotta worry about no Donald Trump. The Lord said he ain't gonna be the president. Either you got a miscommunication, because guess who's sitting in our president's seat <laughs> up there in Washington? Donald Trump. So what does the Bible say we're supposed to do with that kind of a preacher? Stone him in the Old Testament. <laughs> he said, see, the Old Testament said kill him. But now we can't kill him today. What are we going to do? Ignore them. This foolishness for us to try to start thinking about who we don't know what is in God's plan. We better leave everything in God's hands. That's right, because the Bible says don't add, don't take nothing away, so how can you right. do that? Right, because right. they believe that they have communication to make these statements about God, and God said this is going to happen, and God said you don't know what's going to happen. You just say, Lord, if it's your will, let it be done. I'm just going to let your will be done. I'm not predicting anything. I'm just telling you that God's will will be done, whether it's bad or good. He is going to get to glory out of everything in our lives. When we start predicting and making predictions on what's going to happen in the future, we're the ones going to make, look, make ourselves look silly. Because that preacher look real silly right about right now. Then all the people, look, look, look at all the celebrities. If Donald Trump become president, I'm moving. They still here. Raven Simone still here. Well, uh, Whoopi's still here. You know, I was really just, you know, I think I could do more good here than here. You weren't going nowhere anyway. <laughs> you weren't going nowhere. What was his name? Yeah. Snakes on the plane. What's his name? Uh, uh, Samuel L. Jackson. Samuel L. Jackson said if, if Donald Trump became president, he was moving to Africa. Yeah, yeah he's still he's right here. here. These little folks ain't going nowhere. <laughs> That's right. They're not going, they not going nowhere. So guess what? We just put it all in God's hand, and He is the one that's going to take care of us every single time. Any other questions or comments? We're going to finish our uh, continue our lesson in chapter four next week. Uh, if that's all, let us bow our heads over in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you once again for allowing us to be in your presence. Thank you for your love, your joy, and your peace. Thank you for these your children have come out to study your word on this morning. Lord, we thank you for this message of being able to remember what Jesus has done for us and what God has done for us even in the past and that we can uh, memorialize these things by memorizing what he has done. You've already allowed us to, to remember through communion that Jesus died on the cross and to remember on every first Sunday when we go to church to worship that Jesus has died for us and for our sins. As we dismiss from this place, Father, allow us to uh, make sure everything is in order. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.